Hello, I'm Thomas with Geon Technologies. In this video, we'll try to put Red Hawk into some context as well as provide enough vernacular to get started architecting and perhaps even designing systems using Red Hawk. At the end of this video, please feel free to browse our channel for tutorials and demos as well as our GitHub repository for related code blocks. So what is Red Hawk? A clinical definition would be it's a free open source modular application framework which makes it similar to other technologies like Universal Plug and Play, UPnP. However, it is different in that it provides a great deal of infrastructure to maintain separation between the hardware and software of system design. From a bird's eye view, Red Hawk provides three main containers of abstraction. First is the domain, which can contain many of the other two containers, which are nodes and waveforms. Nodes are also called device managers, which gives a strong clue to their purpose. Nodes collect a number of devices and services within them. It might be useful to think of a node then as being like a desktop computer. Its contents can be directly interconnected within it, while also providing interfaces for others to, to utilize. Similarly, when a node starts, it initializes all of its devices and services. Each then registers their resources and interfaces with the domain so that each can be used later. Devices act as proxies to hardware. Some examples could be as simple as opening a serial port or as intricate as bus level memory maps to FPGAs. Moreover, a single device instance could also represent multiple instances of similarly connected hardware. For example, a device could represent all digital radio tuners from a particular manufacturer using their driver. A device's role then would be to detect and provide that interface to each individual tuner. Services on the other hand are even more user specific and often serve as gateways to some external infrastructure. Each service can only provide a single interface and do not bear any similarities really with any other Red Hawk entities. They're that specific. So services then are a somewhat advanced topic and we'll go ahead and shelve this for now. Next up is the waveform. Also called an application, waveforms are how you leverage the modular application framework in Red Hawk onto its Corba backed infrastructure. And it does this with entities called components. And unlike a node, waveforms are intended to come and go over time per the user's demands and the availability of system resources, the latter of which is managed transparently by Red Hawk's infrastructure. When a new instance of a waveform is deployed, or launched as it's sometimes called, new instances of its components are deployed onto executable node resources, that is to say devices, with each spawning its own new thread in the target. We'll return to the subject in a moment. For now, we'll move on to connections. All connections between entities in Red Hawk are handled by ports, and therefore cannot cross domains, not without some user-provided infrastructure, of course. Devices can be connected to one another within nodes and components to one another within waveforms. Furthermore, devices and components can be connected to provide means for passing data between hardware and application. We'll dig into methods for achieving this momentarily. So to recap then, at a very high level, we have a great deal of reuse in the code base. Devices and components can be reused several times throughout the system. And with small changes to maintain uniqueness, a single node can be effectively cloned. A waveform can be launched as multiple distinct instances with little effort. In fact, that's by design. The end result is a very robust infrastructure for distributed processing systems. So let's dig a little deeper by going back to devices. Devices come in three forms. The default, which is simply called device, has a subclass called loadable device. It also has a subclass called executable device. The major differences between these two subclasses is that a loadable device would provide a component access to the node's local file system. An executable device can also provide that ability as well as directly execute the component's binary file when the waveform launches. An example of an executable device is the GPP, the General Purpose Processor. And for the sake of the argument, we'll say that the device in node C is executable, but it's the only GPP in our system that will accept requests to access the file system. In our example system, we'll have three GPPs. Notice the differences in resource availability and architecture. Nodes A and B each have ARM-based GPPs, and node C claims to have an x86 compatible GPP. We'll revisit these differences later when we come to co-location during deployment. Some other details of devices are properties and ports. Properties can act as hooks for reserving and controlling the associated hardware as well as specifying initialization parameters for that hardware. For example, the other device in node A represents a front-end tuner attached to some physical radio antenna. It has a couple of tuning properties and two ports, provides DT for control and data out for the resulting stream. The GPPs, on the other hand, have status-related properties pertaining to the system, including CPU and memory usage. Each component deployed will result in some resource usage by virtue of each being a separate thread as well as by the design of each. The last GPP, node C, 
shows its file system status as well. Just to remind us that we're treating it as the only GPP in our system which is going to support accessing the file system. As mentioned previously, the Redhawk waveform is how you make use of devices. So here are three example components in our waveform. We've not yet discussed examples of components yet, so for our purposes we'll say that from left to right we have a channel filter, a phase shift keying demodulation, and a component to convert the digital stream into words and save it to a file. Redhawk includes several components useful for demodulation and filtering signals, so it's possible that what you need may already exist in the library. Component design is a whole topic in and of itself similar to device design. How granular you make your components will directly impact the overall data rate and processing load your waveform creates when launched. A component that performs 2 plus 2, for example, is far too granular, but one that sends retuning commands for specialized filtering might be just granular enough to be efficient. You'll notice also some similarities between components and devices. Each has ports, properties, dependencies, architectural and language-specific implementations, and of course, each can be connected to one another within its own entity, in this case, a waveform. So here's our hypothetical system. Three nodes, one radio, and a waveform of three components, each being a mixed bag of implementations depending upon specific architectures or other deployment needs. The first component, though, acts as an input to the waveform. It needs to control some front-end device and ingest resulting raw stream for the sake of the other components, similar to the automation of deployment, which we'll discuss shortly. Redhawk provides for a waveform-level dependency called Uses Device. Ports exposed in the waveform can then reference this relationship and the application factory, responsible for deploying applications, will resolve these allocation dependencies to find the appropriate device and make the connection. This dependency is different from components by not being specific to the loadable or executable devices. Instead, this dependency is stating that the port depends on a device which happens to match this description and also happens to have the named port in that connection. Furthermore, this same dependency can be reused by multiple ports in the waveform to ensure that a group of ports all get connected to the same device. If each had its own relationship, each could in theory connect to entirely different devices across the domain. In this case, we have two connections sharing the same user's device relationship, ensuring our component connects to one device and can control it because it could allocate to a specific center frequency and bandwidth. The two DT ports are a reference to a suite of predefined generic interfaces referred to as front end. In this case, we're saying we have a device providing a digital tuner front end and a waveform's deployment depends on connecting one of its compatible components to such a device. Allocation and front-end interfaces are each interesting and advanced topics that we'll shelve for the sake of this introduction. So now that we know about user's device, we should be able to deploy our waveform and establish the full flow of information from the digital receiver to our final component, which will save the received data for us. This is the deployment process. By default, Redhawk performs a round-robin approach to locating devices capable of supporting each component's dependencies. Here, you can see that the first component deploys to node A because it can support one of the component's implementation architectural dependencies. This causes the GPP's resources to be consumed to a point that the second component must be deployed elsewhere. The second component only has one implementation, which is only compatible with the ARM architecture. Node B fits the bill, so the second component is deployed to node B's GPP. The third component, if you recall, requires access to the file system. The only GPP capable of supporting that dependency is in node C, so it is selected automatically. For your convenience, we've added notes above each connection indicating how the transfer will take place. With GPP in node A taking the first component, its connections to the front end device are now physically local and Corbo handles making this an extremely fast, no network required transaction. The second and third components, though, are deployed to other nodes. The resulting connections then, thanks to Corba, have translated into network connections. So what if you wanted specific components to always be node local for that super fast piped connection? This feature is called co-location. By lumping components together with co-location, you can load balance your waveform and system for resource usage as well as link utilization. Given the round robin approach at deployment, co-location then creates a super set of dependencies for all components involved. A GPP must then be able to support that whole set of dependencies or else an entirely different GPP will be selected for the next test for those components. So let's say the first two components benefit the most from co-location and that, this time, Node's GPP could theoretically support having both components deployed to it. The deployment happens and Node's GPP is now chugging along at maximum usage, but the data rate from the front end through to the second component is extremely fast local connection. 
The third component again is deployed to the one device that can accept it in node C, and the last connection is still over the network. What if we want to lump the second and third components together with co-location? Well, deployment would fail, because no node's GPP can handle both sets of dependencies since the second component is ARM only and the third requires access to the file system. This failure to deploy part of the waveform would of course cause the entire waveform itself to not deploy. We're just showing the connections here to indicate what parts of the dependencies and relationships would have been successfully validated. For example, GPPs in nodes B and C are dimmed since neither can be used for our set of dependencies. And this brings us to the end of this introduction to Red Hawk. At the very least, we hope you came away with the necessary vernacular and high-level understanding of Red Hawk, as well as some key topics you may want to use to produce an efficient and robust system architecture using Red Hawk. Thank you for watching. Again, my name is Thomas with Geon Technologies, and as always, please feel free to contact us for more information and in-class training, as well as peruse our channel and website, geontech.com, for more topics.